Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte, and we are here live at Build Studio in New York City. Uh, for those of you watching live at home, please don't hesitate to be a part of the show and submit a question. It's easy. All you have to do is press the button right next to this video labeled Submit a Question. Uh, or you can hit us up on Twitter at Build Series NYC. If your question is really good and time permits, you may ask it live on air. Uh, 2018 marks 25 years since the 1993 Waco, Texas siege, wherein the ATF conducted a raid on a small religious community near Waco, Texas. A 51-day standoff with leader David Koresh and his followers, the Branch Davidians, ensued and ended after an FBI assault led to a fire that killed 76 people. Uh, Paramount Network's Waco details the events leading up to and surrounding the tragic events that transpired in a way I don't think we've seen yet. Both sides of the story, warts and all. Uh, joining me to discuss the series shortly are creators Drew Dowdle and John Dowdle, author of Stalling for Time, My Life as an FBI Negotiator, Gary Nesner, author of Waco, or Survivor's Story, David Thibodeau, and stars of Waco, Taylor Kitsch, Michael Shannon, Melissa Benoist, and Paul Sparks are here, everybody. How about that lineup, huh? That is, that is something. That's something. They'll be out in a moment. Before we bring them out, though, I believe we have a trailer for the show or a clip, so let's go ahead and uh, run that clip. You've looked to me to be your leader, to guide you on this journey. But I'm no leader. I'm a follower, just like you. God has instructed me to stay here and wait for his sign. This is our time to prove through suffering that we are worthy of the miracle that's to come. kingdom of heaven is coming. I promise you. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep it going for Taylor, Michael, Paul, Melissa, David, Gary, Drew, and John. Everybody from Wago is here, everybody. Guys, uh, congratulations on this show. I was saying downstairs, I got a chance to see uh, the first half, the first three episodes. It is phenomenal work. Absolutely amazing. Uh, I want to begin with Drew and John uh, because I was reading, uh, I believe, that you guys in the beginning weren't even looking to write. You were working on another project entirely, uh, doing some research. And when you came upon David's story and you, and you, and you kind of got into this, this you found to be way more interesting than what you guys are working on and started working on this. I, is there any truth to that? Can you take us back to the beginning? What got you guys hooked into this story? Yeah, we were uh, initially trying to flesh out like a kind of bad guy character. And we said, uh, you know, maybe in his, you know, history, maybe he grew up with the Branch Davidians and he was so traumatized by that that um, he was evil. And, uh, and we stumbled across David Thibodeau's book about four years ago. And I got about 10 pages in. I was like, oh, my God, this is totally different than I thought it was going to be. And I called Drew and I was like, you got to read this immediately. And, and uh, yeah, then we flew to Bangor, Maine. We reached out to Tibbs on Facebook and uh, flew out to Bangor, Maine couple weeks later and and uh yeah not long after we met gary and and after having read his book and we realized there's just so much on on both the branch davidian side and the fbi side that was um simplified in the media at the time and distorted and, and the opportunity to go back and look at a very um tragic and controversial story uh in american history from uh, the people who really lived through it and to really kind of correct a lot of that misinformation uh was really appealing yeah, so it's interesting you, you point out that you were looking to create a bad guy and you looked to David because I think once you, you step into this, yeah, there's, there are a lot of things going on there, but I, I don't think he's objectively bad. I don't think anyone in this, in, the, in this story is objectively bad. I think they were all trying to live their life or do what they thought was the right thing or the best thing at that time. There's a lot of stuff with like the people versus OJ or like I, Tanya, a lot of media is now recontextualizing history for us. And so that was that a big objective for you going in? Like now that we know this story that we've identified what's going on here, we have to tell this in the proper way and show it both sides, warts and all. Yeah, that was a big part of it. I mean, in the immediate aftermath of the fire uh, where you know a lot of people died, uh, the attorney general's approval ratings went up in the immediate aftermath because they had been so dehumanized at the time. 
And we found like once we got to know some of the people inside Mount Carmel and, you know, in the FBI as well, like once we got to know some of the names and, and had a sense of the faces, like it totally changed the, the meaning for us. You know, in the news, it was a tank versus a building. And just putting faces on it uh, makes it a totally different experience. Yeah, humanizing everybody totally adds a different dimension to it, which actually I'd love to kind of run down the line because I think we all experienced it at different points in our life up front. But uh, we'll start with you, Taylor. What was your memory uh, of the Waco uh, event growing up? And how um. I mean, it was international news, obviously, but I was 12, yeah. so it was, I, I think I remember just that end scene, more or less, of just the compound in flames, but other than that, I, I you know, wasn't really privy to it. Yeah, we, we were kids at the time, Alyssa, I believe you were even younger. I was five. You were five, yeah. yeah. But my, uh, my family's from Texas, and I remember my dad being worried, and I, I just remember the shock yeah. my parents felt. And Michael? Oh, yeah, it was, it's just something I saw on TV, you know, yeah. something I saw on the news. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it really registered much more than that. Yeah. Paul, do you have it? A- no, I was, you know, I'm originally from Oklahoma, and even though I had moved to New York by that time, and uh, I was much older than five, uh, <laughs> I kind of had my ear down. You know, I felt a little bit of ownership toward it just because it was sort of close to where I was from. But, you know, my impression of what was going on was that there was – there were some crazy people in a place with a bunch of guns, and there was a standoff. Like, that's what I remember. I sort of yeah. remember all the, the military side of it. Yeah. Well, I, that's what I was curious to hear, because I think that's what a lot of people took away at the time, is that there were crazy people with guns, and the military did what they had to do. That was kind of the story that was put out there that, that the American people saw the most. And, and I think 25 years later, we're seeing a lot more of the actual story. Uh, is that something you gentlemen had set out to do with your book, was tell the story, but at the time, you know, it didn't garner national attention like it does now because we're at an anniversary or there's a show about it. Or what has that been like for you 25 years uh, trying to share your, your side? Well, for me personally, you know, it garnered national attention back there, but it was bad attention. I mean, like everyone has said, it was so demonized <clears throat> that my story didn't even matter. And the fact that it was politicized, it was, you know, uh, we, Clinton was an office Democratic uh, liberal, if you will, and I, those were, you know, I was raised with that kind of Democrat liberal way of thinking, and to find that nobody cared about my story. The ACLU didn't care, a third of the people in there were, were, you know, black people from all over the country, all over the world, really, I mean, English, everywhere. It, it just seemed like nobody cared about the people in, inside to the point where I felt compelled I had to write the book. And then I basically, I didn't care what happened after that if it just disappeared into history. It didn't matter. At least, at least here's, here's what I saw, and it's not at all what you think. Well, my book came out uh, a long time after Waco, um, but, uh, and my book contains things that weren't related to Waco. But the one overwhelming um, similarity we see, there's been at least a dozen documentaries through the years yeah. in the 25 years. Most of them uh, really simplify what was going on. A uh, bunch of kooks and nuts on one hand, or other people feel the terrible government people came in and just wanted to kill everybody. And of course, neither one of those uh, stories is remotely close to being the truth or nuanced enough to talk about the, the human dimension, both inside and out. There were good people uh, inside. Uh, you can argue about David Koresh uh, and, and what his motivations were. In the FBI, there was a lot of us working very hard to save lives. And then there were some folks in the FBI that wanted to take a much tougher, uh, more confrontative approach that, that ended up harming that effort. So it's a complex story. And if people watch the show, I think they're going to have an opportunity to see that in a way they never have before. Uh, for sure. Have you guys gotten to see the show in its entirety? Anybody yet? Or? I have. You have? <laughs> OK. I've seen the first three. You've seen the first three. Uh, can you talk about the experience? I only watch my scenes, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's it. Delivered special edit. Which is There's a special the tailor cut. There's a tailor <laughs> cut. We can keep an eye out for that's coming soon. Uh, can you guys talk about just kind of reliving those moments and those conversations rendered in such vivid detail and bringing you back? W- what was that experience like? To sort of relive it. In well, uh, for me, I mean, I one of the things that always bothered me about Waco because of the simplistic way people looked at it is they didn't see the the effort that my negotiation team yeah. 
had so successfully undertaken to get 35 people out alive, including 21 children. So the, the, the show really shows the efforts made on the negotiation side. Obviously, it's, there's, for dramatic effect, it, you know, there, there's some, some differences. But by and large, you see the overall tone of a group of people that are trying to get this thing resolved and nobody be hurt. And it's frustrating. You know, in negotiators, we felt we got caught between uh, David Koresh and, and what he was motivated by and our own command that, that had their own ideas. So that comes out very clearly in this great production. What was very frustrating for, for me and us being in the building was the fact that there's an absolute lack of communication. The FBI are in control of all the communication. We have no way to establish a line. The only line is to the FBI. So they're doing every day, they're doing, um, <clears throat> they're having these, these um, they're answering questions for the media and their word cult, they're using you know all these really terrible words and there's, there's no way to defend yourself. You are absolutely defenseless and voiceless. And then just, you know, at the, at the final day when it's all over, people just feel like, oh, it's just justified a bunch of religious fanatics killed themselves. And you're like, you really have no idea what just happened. And that they use tanks against American citizens. That should have just been a huge red flag. Having seen these three episodes and worked on this show, is there a, a small sense of closure knowing that after 25 years that this message, this version of the story, this side of the story is finally being told this way? Frankly, I'm just, I'm just happy that the people are being humanized. Yeah. And... History won't stand the, the way the way it has been, or they're just so demonized, and uh, just the fact that people are going to know some of the stories of the incredible people that lived there and, frankly, died for what they believed in. No matter what you think of these people, they gave their lives for what they truly believed in. And at the at the end of the day, I think that that's that's an incredible tale that needs to be told, and that they should be honored for that, and not and not mystified and demonized. For sure. Taylor, you um, you like disappear into this role, man. Like if nobody told me, you, see, you underwent a physical transformation as well. I think I read you lost like what thirty pounds to to arrive at this character, and I was wondering <clears throat> if you could talk about how that physicality ends up informing your performance and decisions that you make as you wrap your head around David Koresh. Um, a lot of times when you play someone that's lived and left a legacy, and which is debatable or subjective, but it, it's more of like a lot of that homework is kind of done for you. I remember talking to John and Drew of just, it was literally, a, you know, it was, you're watching tapes or whatnot, and you wa I had the, I can watch Dave in this, you know, week three of the siege or week four. And... Um, and so it's, it's literally as simple as looking at him and getting to that. Yeah. So that just answered a lot of questions with the transformation, the physical part. So um, I had four months. I just kept asking for more time because obviously he's so complex and, um, and to lose the weight the right way. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but honestly, it, it, the psychological part is, is quite literally everything as well, you know, that goes into it and, and trying to understand the whys you know, of, of what he believed in and, and starting from scratch and working with John and, and Drew and checking in with them every week with 20 questions each. And uh, so that was a, an amazing process. What, were, what do you look for when you're watching hours of footage of an individual and you're trying to sort of boil down the essence and, and figure out how to dial in? What, what are you looking for I, within that tape? I think that's the beauty of what we do is, you know, if someone else goes and plays Koresh, they're going to see something different or attach themselves or see uh, or read a quote differently. And, and um, I don't know, I think over time you start to assimilate so much information that once in a while you come across an article or something that they send that they thought was interesting or it's a phone call. Like for me, it was a, there was a few obviously, but there's a phone call to his mother that just rocked me and uh it just reminded me or told me a big piece of him that you know his real name was vernon howell and right. you know he called he's been shot and he thinks he's gonna die and he calls his mom you know you have this guy that is at this elevated you know position and uh it just said a lot to me you know it, it kind of brought him back to a kid and it was more vernon than david in my humble opinion calling yeah. so that was just like you know, we added that scene into the show because it was, yeah, so I was just, I read it and I was, I begged them to put it in there. And I was like, I was even like, logistically, man, we could do this in 20 minutes. I know we got to shoot fast. 
Uh, but they, it's just a testament to them, and they were all ears, and they're like done, you know. So yeah. that begs a question: when you do have six, it's uh, six episodes to to play with. You do that's a lot of time, but you still have to make cuts. You have to make decisions about what makes it into the story. Uh, were there a, a lot of difficult decisions about stuff like that, about how much to include of his past, about uh, different story elements that you wanted to be in there, but you just didn't have the time? A absolutely. Uh, with David's past specifically, like we had, at one point we wrote all these flashbacks of how he ended up at Mount Carmel and how he took, you know, control. Yeah. And then we realized none of these characters come back. You know, Steve wasn't there yet. Uh, you know, Gary Nessner obviously wasn't there yet. Like, it just, uh, Rachel was, um, but not the rest of them. And we realized it just, it seemed like a non sequitur. And then to try and loop that back in uh, didn't feel right. There's there also, you know, just like little weird things. Like uh, there was some guy like who rode a white horse up to Mount Carmel and knocked at the door in the middle of the siege. And, uh, and uh, Jesse, you know. Jesse Amen was his Je name. Jesse That's Amen. Yeah. Oh, my, is oh that? my God. We really want to do this. this story. Fight by that the way. Yeah, go <laughs> for it. I've done, I I've done some research long before I knew the show was coming. I was always fascinated by the story. I don't recall the white, the white horse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, That's, That's what he said. Drew and I kept trying to jam that into the opening of an episode just because it's so weird. And uh, He made it yeah. for about three days until David Crash was like, all right, you got to go. Yeah. <laughs> he threw this him out. This guy's crazy. Get him out. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> Actually. And that was not one yeah, of the 35 the, we negotiated the, out. The middle, <laughs> the middle of the night, he's knocking on the door, and, the, you know, at that point, the light system was going, and the horns were going, and all yeah, that. Yeah. And it's like, who's knocking at the front door? We're in a seat here, and it was, the, it was this guy, Jesse Amen, and he was just coming to tell us that he's had, got 100,000 people ready to come in and fight for us and all that. I'm like... Well, the army, the army, amen. Yeah, that's what it was. Right, it was yeah, awesome. We, yeah, it was. We actually we have a negotiation tape where the negotiators yeah. are saying, uh, "Do what we say, or we're going to send Jesse Amen back into you." <laughs> <laughs> uh, the perimeter slipped up a little bit on that one. There was. An, <laughs> we were inward you looking. Guys didn't see the white horse the white trying horse to get over the high. the rails. It, it's actually kind of funny because I, I left on March 25th, and I think he went in on March 26th. <laughs> And I was already leaving town. I called back to the negotiators and I said, you know, when I was there, people were coming out. Right. <laughs> Not coming back in. That's pretty That's amazing. That's a really good point for your career. Uh, <laughs> uh, Melissa, your performance also equally fantastic. Uh, and as a viewer, I got to say, there's a, there's a lot of similarities uh, in, a, in a way that, to what I'm used to seeing you play, you're sort of like the, the super curl of the house, kind of like the queen bee in a way. <laughs> I know that's a bit of a stretch, but I did see a lot of strength in the character you were playing, despite uh, the history, despite being married at, what was it, 14 or, or 12 years old and all these different things. But it's a, it's a very complex role, and I think you do an, an amazing job at it. Talk to me about uh, sinking your teeth into this one and, and kind of how you prepped and, and how you wrapped your head around. Uh, I... <laughs> Rachel still is, feels very enigmatic to me. Um, and there wasn't a lot of concrete material for me to look at. Um, so a lot of it was me and Taylor on the day sort of talking through things. I, I got to talk to David Thibodeau a little bit about her. But what struck me the most and what really intensely drew me to her were the pictures that I saw. And this woman, I don't... I don't think she had any frills about her and very stoic and strong. And um, I don't know, I sensed that she had a lot of pride in her position and, and um, her relationship with David. And she might have been one of the few women he listened to or she could talk to him and he could, you know, she had some sway there. But I also, it was fun to explore that, that relationship. And Drew and John, is it true that you guys, once you saw like what Melissa was bringing to the character, you 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 had to expand it. You you wanted more. You you started writing more in there, for it to sort of go further and go deeper with Rachel. Absolutely. Like we saw, you know, episode one. Like I think our first meeting, she said, "I want to play Rachel strong. I don't want her ever to be weak." And we just thought that was such a wonderful perspective on the character, and we wanted that too. We we just loved that idea. And, and just like scene after scene, it'd be just a little thing, like so, you know, like a little like interlude, and she would just bring so much to like every, you know, hey, you know, a lot of the scenes she's not even talking, but she just does so much with 
nothing. Once we saw, like, oh my god, like we give her one line, she just crushes, and uh, like let's let you know, let's just build that, let's build that, and and um, by the end, like you, you know, you really like she's. I feel like one of the really stand out, you know, someone you really love. Yeah, in the writer's room at first blush, we thought, as far as the, the female Branch Davidian characters, that Judy Schneider, who's um, Steve Schneider's wife, played, played by Paul, and Judy played by Andrea Riseborough, um, that her story was kind of uh, on its face, maybe the, the more interesting, and in that she is, you know, mar happily married to, to Steve, but then has a baby with David, and it's that gave us a lot to work with. Yeah. Um, but then we got in the writer's room, we realized that <clears throat> Rachel... Uh, and also her uh, sister Michelle, played by Julia Garner, w were characters that we were not um, spending enough time with and that were equally yeah. interesting it, yeah. you know, in every way. And the fact that they grew up on Mount Carmel and that this was their, this is all they knew. You know, Judy and Steve had come from Hawaii and they had lived around the world where you know, this um, Rachel in particular being you know, David's first wife and being this real leadership position there and seeing the group expand and her relationship with the other women and um, it just, it was a process where it just, it, the character became more and more interesting. They got it right on, you got it right on. I mean, Rachel was so strong, you know, um, Michelle, they're just very, very strong women. I mean, very, very much so. And not only that, the Joneses, the, the brothers and the sisters and the Jones family it was the very unique and I think kind of were a big reason that, that all of this was able to happen. Mm. And uh, there should be a lot more, more done on that. But yeah, all those words you used were exactly Rachel. So it was, you, you got it. I was very, very proud. <laughs> that's gotta, that's gotta feel cool to hear that, right? To have that firsthand account say that you captured the essence of this person and you've, you've kind of nailed it. Oh, of course it does. Yeah. But I, I, more than that, I also, I think, like you're saying, towards the end, um, when we were filming the scene at the end, at the end yeah, yeah. I was gutted. <laughs> and I felt so much love for this and what she went for this woman and what she went through. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. so, yeah, I do. That is really nice to hear. Hey, Michael, uh, I want to talk to you uh, about Nesner. And I'm curious, as an actor, when you have the opportunity to speak to the person that you're portraying, how much do you leverage that? How much do you go in for that and utilize that? Do you, do you talk as much as you can? To do uh, you know, it depends on the person. I mean, uh, Gary is a very warm, approachable human being. Uh, he's very, uh, he seems very grateful for this project and uh, to have, uh, like David and Gary were saying earlier, to have this story getting told. And, uh, and Gary is a, an incredibly intelligent person who has a lot of amazing stories to tell. You know, this is just this is just one of them. Um, I I was fascinated by the 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 notion, the art of negotiation. It's not something I would ever claim to be any good at at all. Uh, I can't even barely negotiate with my children <laughs> get them to go to school in the morning. So uh, I was just fascinated. I just wanted to know as, as much as I could. And, and Gary's just very, like I say, very approachable. I, I didn't know what to expect, uh, yeah. if he would be intimidating or not. But in hindsight, of course, he's not going to be intimidating. He's a negotiator. Negotiator, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Valid point. Yeah. Um, you know, you you got maybe it's just like the the nature of uh, all of your projects releasing at once. But I, f I get the impression like that you never I'm trying stop. to take over the world. Yeah, you never stop working. It's man. me against Putin. <laughs> you never <laughs> stop working. What what about this project and this commitment that you said I got to do it? I got to carve out the time. I got to be there. I got to be in this story. I think it's just a lot of what you've already heard. You yeah. Know, uh, uh, getting to put some humanity into a story that just was never very well told in the first place. And, you know, in the, the times in which we live, to see some people genuinely trying to understand one another and have some empathy for one another and try and, you know, save each other from their own imminent demise, you know, it's just, uh, it's a nice, nice thing to see. I know it doesn't end well. We all know it doesn't end well, but I was very moved by the fact that there were moments along the way 
where it wasn't all doom and gloom and where these people actually did kind of understand yeah. one another's points of view, seems to me. It is. It is kind of like a bittersweet thing because in those moments you are kind of taking, like this is a very sweet thing, but there is that part of the back of your mind that knows how things are going to end and where it leads. And it, yeah. uh, it's just what makes it so engaging and compelling as a show. Paul, your character, you play Steve, David's right-hand man, mm -hmm. and uh, we briefly touched on the the complex dynamic between Steve, his wife, and David. Uh, and that could be said for almost anybody's relationship w within that compound. It's a very complex dynamic. I'm wondering how uh, you and, and Taylor and everybody kind of work together to to form that, that triad and, and develop that relationship amongst the three of you. Well, you know... I mean, I think human, humans in general have pretty complicated lives. They're complicated people. And occasionally you get lucky enough that people, you know, really write the hell out of a script and they, they, they write a character that um, sort of explores the nuance and complexity of, of humans and their relationships with each other. And Steve, yes, had a very unique, uh, was in a unique situation, I think, where I started with it and trying to understand, like, how could anybody be in this possible yeah, situation? Exactly. You know, whereas his wife is having a child with a guy right over there who he's friends. With. Like, how is that supposed to work? And and I think that you know, through working with these guys, listening to them talk about. Um, the relationship as they saw it, reading Thibodeau's book. I talked with Sue Schneider, who's uh, Steve's sister, um, and got a sort of a picture of him. You know, I, I don't know how else to say it, but, you know, don't underestimate a community and how, how powerful that is for people to feel like they belong to something and that what they're doing matters. And I think that... Um, we are willing to put up with and deal with those complexities, even if they're really hard truths, uh, in order to maintain, you know, the the group setting and to like sort of protect the herd, which is I think very in Steve's mind. I think he was really he felt responsible for bringing a lot of people there. He was sort of David's guy that brought a lot of people in, and I I get the sense that he felt very responsible for everybody and so you know he was working really hard you know well yeah that was always uh you know uh, before being able to see it realized in, in in such a way on this show and seeing everybody humanized in such a way when you just read you know articles and research i always struggle with that idea of what was it that uh that david had that allowed all of this stuff to exist and you're right but the power of that community really is what drives everybody and uh, you see that through uh john leguizamo's character when he you know, uh, goes into the base and, and suddenly it's like, as a viewer, you're like, hang on, do we, uh, does he does he warn them? Does he give them the heads up? Like, even though I know the history, you're watching it and you just see the emotion, you see that play out and you wait for that split little second where things are going to change. But again, that point in the back of your mind, now you know exactly how this story goes. Um, I love the, this show and I'm very excited to see the, the three episodes and the conclusion and what you guys have done with it. And, and I'm grateful uh, that, that you guys have worked so hard to tell this story in this way so that we can see these human characters and understand this story better. Uh, before I keep going on and telling you how great it was, I got to turn it over to the audience because they have questions as well. We're going to turn that way. We got some mics no, in the you room. Keep going. But uh, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but I could do that all day. Uh, th so let's go ahead. Our first question is going to come uh, from right over here in the back. Hi, guys. Thanks for being here. Um, Waco has always been something I've been super fascinated by ever since I learned about it in high school. And one of the assignments that we had in this class that I took was we had to write a letter to David Koresh and talk to him about how we feel about him and how, what, how it affected the future. So I'm curious if you got to have a meeting with David Koresh, um, would you do it? And what would you say to him if you did? In a heartbeat, <laughs> would I do it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I don't know what I would say just yet, but um, yeah, it's just it's just so fascinating to me, and I, I think there's you know we're talking backstage and for weeks and during the process, but it's like there's a lot of questions that'll never be answered, you know, and I think you can't forget that either. And um, but yeah, uh, without a doubt, I would. I mean, yeah, I guess fundamentally the question is, you know, was it worth it? Do you think are your 
those convictions that you were holding on to, was it really worth it in the end to 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 die for that? Do you you know, I'd be curious unfortunately, I'd be very curious to talk to his spirit, you know, the, which is not something you can do, I guess, unless you have a Ouija board. Or something. <laughs> but that, that's what I'm curious about. Uh, yeah, I, I would have I loved to have been in the same room with him. I mean, I feel like that sort of my sort of unearthing of who Steve Schneider was and my, my love affair with him. We have the same birthday, by the way. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, Libras. Uh, <laughs> that was my whole character. I just read. I just read my. I just read Brett, my horoscope. Brett, Brett 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 that's how I sort of add, wa add water acting. Uh, but you know, I would. I would. I would. Uh, I would like to have been there to to been in those epic, long um, sermon where people where he would fall asleep and you would wait and. Li I mean, I. I, I wanted. I would love to have been there to hear it too see what that feels like the to be in the presence of of you know something so i mean the lamb you know like to what is that what what would that be i, I would love to have been there for that and that's what i think the beauty of this is too it is it is behind those doors you see these guys work their thing what it is those relationships and what dave is saying by himself or just one on one with his wife or with Steve, like that, that's what you want to explore because there are the things that we all can read on the, or skimming or whatnot that you can see right away. But I mean, the fascination is, is the relationships. I would like to have seen David meet or talk with someone like James Tabor, one of the theologians that actually had a deep, deep understanding of scripture and spent their lives with their deep understanding of scripture and have that conversation, number one, first and foremost. That would have been the most fascinating thing I think that ever could have been. The second thing is I would love for David to have met Taylor. <laughs> and oh my Lord, that would have been such another great conversation. And I just think, yeah, I'd like to see the look in your eyes after the first uh, few hours of study. It would, it would have been fan it would have just been phenomenal. I would just add one thing too, like similar to what Michael said, I would, I would be very curious to ask him if, you know, when the ATF raided the, the compound uh, at the beginning, that, you know, in effect triggered his prophecy, the prophecy that the fifth seal would open and that the armies of Babylon would come and attack them. Um, and so on one hand, it was, you know, validating his prophecy, and I think it really um, galvanized the, the belief system within uh, Mount Carmel. But in the negotiation tapes, as you um, listen to him and listen to him talk to the FBI and how much he was defending himself from that moment and saying we didn't start it. And he seemed to have a lot of regret that any of this had ever happened. So I would ask him like, if he could go back and undo the ATF shootout and just continue living there, would that be his preference or would it be um, to see this prophecy fulfilled? That's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Dan, I was curious, of all the conversations you've had in the past, do any stand out? Do you remember one in particular? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm still digesting, Drew. That was oh, yeah. That was <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> OK, I can focus. Do you, do you have any conversations uh, that you recall that stand out with Koresh? Any in I mean, we see a bunch depicted in the show, but I'm wondering if for you personally, if there's, if there's a defining moment uh, that really hits you or really resonated with you that sticks with you all these years later? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, there's several, but the most, one of the most powerful, <clears throat> there were things that happened to me that I cannot explain to any other human being. I do cover it a little in the book. It gets it almost like a bit mystical, which I'm not going to do that for you here. It's something that there's things that happen to you in life where you could never explain it to your best friend, but you know what it meant to you and that it was something otherworldly. Okay. Other than that, there was a moment where Koresh and I were on the roof, and we were, and I think you guys kind of captured this too in the, in the film. The burden of, of well, yeah, it kind of, but it, that, it was in that context where we were, we were sitting there working on shingles, shingling the roof, and David, it was about six months before the raid, and David said, Thibodeau, what are you going to do when there's tanks going all up and down the Double E Ranch Road here? And I said, David, that's never going to happen. Do you think the government, no matter how bad you think you are or whatever they think that Babylon's going to come in, they're going to bring tanks? They're going to militarize and bring tanks onto this property with all these people here? That's not going to happen. Six months later, I'm looking at tanks running up and down the road. Wow. 
So that would be probably the most powerful thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I flew out there that night from Washington, and I got to speak to David and negotiated with him for, for quite a while. And the thing that I think surprised me the most uh, was someone who had just been through this horrific firefight and was himself wounded and had his community severely damaged, my overriding impression was, I can work with this guy. Um, you know, he would go up and down, be angry, but not directly at us. He was directly at ATF. I was pretty confident that, um, the, given the control of extenuating circumstances, we could make progress, and we started off that way. And the whole thing got off to a bad start when, when David asked us to, to release a, a broadcast to, to the world, 58 minutes, promising to come out. And when he didn't do that, uh, the position that I represented sort of lost some influence in that it really angered the FBI that he had broken his promise, and that started another set of moments. But I would talk to David again about, you know, if I could talk to him again. I, I think we could find a way to work it out if, if we could have kept everybody calm at the same time. Uh, next question, I believe, is from right here. Hey, guys. Uh I know for, for the cast, like you guys have played some really interesting and powerful characters. I was just wondering for each of you, what was the challenge going deep into uh, your roles for uh, this miniseries? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I just think it's hard to wrap your head around just how difficult what Gary and his team were trying to do. You know, um, one of the things that you don't see a lot in the show uh, for obvious reasons, because you're cutting to the moments of great adrenaline or power or whatnot, but the, there's a lot of tedium uh, involved. There's long stretches of time where nothing happens, and these guys are just, you know, sitting there thinking, Jesus, why am I here? What's, when, when is something going to get better, you know? And, I mean, am I painting this uh, no. accurately? Yeah, and so, um, so trying to... I wanted to be able to capture that that uh, that sense, even though we weren't showing, we, we didn't have the luxury of showing all of that uh, time-wise, but I would, that sense of fatigue and tedium fighting against a great motivation to get what you want accomplished, you know. I think, I think what was, what was, I think you were asking about this show in particular. I think for me, the thing that was hardest about Steve was, I felt like that there were really contradictory things happening for him. You know, that he was simultaneously like a really nice guy, but at the same time, he was like furious about what was going on. Um, that he uh, loved David like a brother, I, I believe that, and also despised him and thought that at times he was maybe one of the worst people that there was. And I think that trying to like hold those things inside of you at the same time uh, is, is it, it's a bit of a trick, you know, and, but to me, it, it, it was what was most uh, fun about, about working on this one, yeah. Well, I think with Rachel, <laughs> what I found the most difficult that I, I don't know if this is something she actually felt, but uh, the question of doubt, I think, too, came about because of the children and specifically her kids. And I don't know if that was something she ever felt concerning what they believed in, but maybe her relationship with David, I think it was certainly tested during the siege. And that was a, a difficult thing to grapple with. I mean, this would be like a 20 minute answer. Um, <laughs> no, I mean. Go for it. <laughs> Again, you just you you work with everybody, and you you just it, there's some things, a lot of things. I've never played anyone so further away from me, on so many levels, and some things I obviously don't agree with and don't understand, and probably never will. So to play that and to marry yourself emotionally to something you can't break down was, I mean, John will know, and you know we had how many talks, you know, in between takes or in between setups, but um, that was probably the toughest thing for me is just to try and be as authentic and so grounded because the second you don't see that or the second you start to doubt Dave, it's all for naught, you know? So um, that was huge for me and, and, and you know, you kind of give yourself to the material and John and the process and 
you know, everyone else around you and kind of lean on them as well. So, um, and that was, you know, beautiful to explore as well of, of beats that you think the scene's going to go this way or the phone call is going to go this way. And, and then all of a sudden it's just turned on its head and that, then you find that authenticity, you know? So that was a lot of fun to explore and it was incredibly fulfilling being a part of and, and working with these guys. We had a, you know, every time you work with a new actor or something, especially when the stakes are so high, it's like our first day, like in Santa Fe. It's right. It's like just because you four months of just assimilating, like just a ridiculous amount of material, and everyone's kind of just doing their own thing in New York and everywhere else. And then we come together to tell this story. Then we disperse, and our first meeting was just like a. We just threw up on each other, basically. <laughs> we're like, oh, I read Mark Bro's book, and I was in this hey, book. Hey, man, what else did you read? <laughs> what, did you, this revelation, did that do anything for you? No? Uh, you know, it was just like, and that was a beautiful thing, too, because, well, God, you don't want the other way around where I didn't read anything or he didn't read anything, and he's just looking at you with a blank face. So Yeah, I thought I was playing Nesner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. But, so... That's the long-winded version. I think the other thing, just quickly, that's very tricky about uh, this show is uh, the amount of scenes that happen on the phone. Um, we had to do a lot of scenes on the phone. And uh, full disclosure, sometimes we weren't actually able to do them with one another. So yeah. you'd be doing a very intense phone call with, like, the assistant director. <laughs> I am I am not coming out. <laughs> yes, you are. Right. No, I will not come out of here. <laughs> no, Is that akin to like acting yeah, against green screen or something where you just kinda have to get in your zone and just believe it and commit you to just, it? Yeah, you just yeah, you just Luckily luckily uh, I've known Mike for a long time and his face is burned onto my retinas. <laughs> and so so literally I I see him everywhere I go. <laughs> so, if you were lucky, Drew would do the other side. Yeah, yeah well, if you were really yeah, lucky, I was, Drew. I, was I didn't have that to behold. experience with Drew. <laughs> uh, I'm getting the signal. We got to wrap things up. But uh, again, Waco, it premieres uh, this week, uh, the 24th, I believe, on Paramount Television. And guys, uh, thank you so much for being here. One more time, round of applause. Thank, thank you, everybody, all. for joining thank us. You thank you so much.